The uh, our speaker today is Rose Poor. She's a local attorney specializing in elder law, but has a, a very very passionate about Medicaid and uh, the Medicaid regulations, and so she's going to share with us today some of the myths and mistakes that are associated with Medicaid. So I'm going to hand it off to Rose, and Rose, uh, feel free to tell us what you know. <laughs> well, that's always dangerous. Um, hi, I'm Rose. Uh, I am a elder law attorney in Denver, uh, actually Lakewood with the Lakewood Legal Center. Uh, we handle Medicaid applications, um, Medicaid benefits, and appeals. So a lot of people come into my office with a lot of misconceptions about how to apply for or how you are eligible for Medicaid. So I've done a lot of work in this area. Um, I am also... <laughs> I'm also a baby boomer, uh, so people of my generation are going on Medicare at the rate of about 16000 a day. Uh, a lot of us in my generation did not save properly for disability. Many of them saved for old age or for retirement, but not for dis dis disability. So it comes as a surprise to many of our clients that Medicare does not pay for many of the things that people need when they become disabled. And then they're in a crisis mode and they're starting to talk about, oh my God, now what do I do? Because I don't want to spend all my money. So uh, in the Denver area, alone, the average cost of Medicaid is $8,287 a month, and that's for the basics. Now, I know people from all over the state are dialing in here, and the average, uh, the state of Colorado is divided into four areas, and these areas all have different averages. Denver, of course, is the highest. But uh, that's just for the basics for a skilled nursing facility. Assisted living is running between five and six thousand a month, and independent living is running between two and three thousand dollars a month. The average that people have in their savings account outside of their home is uh, anywhere between fifty and two hundred thousand. And as you can tell from those figures, that's going to go pretty fast, usually within a year. So uh, I, I, I tell people, you know, they're making us live longer, but they don't know what to do with us when we get there. And that's very true, and that's where both of our services come into play. For those of us in the baby boom generation and older and younger, uh, the question is not when or if they're going to end up on Medicaid, it's when. Uh, at this time in Colorado, over 60% of people in skilled nursing facilities are on Medicaid. So it's going to happen, and that's unfortunate, but it's something that, it's one of the reasons that we need to talk about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, Medicaid came into existence in 1964. Uh, it was not available in all states, however, until 1982, believe it or not. Dental services were added in 1989. The look-back period was instituted in 1993, and the current look-back increased to 60 months in 2005. Now, I want to make a very important point here. The look-back period is not five years. It is 60 months. That's very important. We had clients that came into our office that didn't understand why they had been uh, denied or why their mother had been denied Medicaid because she gave them the house in March of 2004, and this was in April of, uh, no, it's the other way around. They, Mom gave them the house in April of 2009, and we were now in March of 2014 and they applied for Medicaid. Well, guess what? That was one month too soon and mom was thrown off for transfer of assets for less than fair market value. 
So it's important to keep in mind that you're not dealing with entire years. You're dealing with months and even days. They will cut it down that close. So, um, you know, many people say, oh, the look back's five years. Uh-uh. Correct your clients. It is not five years. It is 60 months. Uh, financial assets, again, this is another very misunderstood area. If a person is single, they're only supposed to have $2,000 in assets. However, a married couple can have $121,240 in assets. Big difference. Um, and, I mean, I've had many clients who have come in and said that they're going to have to spend their entire life savings, and it's just not true. Rose, what's considered a couple? Married, married. couple. Okay. And that includes same-sex marriage. Okay. So uh, it's, it is a married a couple. And uh, the other advantage to that is although the what's called the institutionalized spouse the one going into care can only have $2,000. If the couple together has less than that 121, anything that is just in the institutionalized spouse's uh, name can be transferred to the community spouse or the one not going into care. And that's not penalized. Gifts between spouses are not penalized. Okay. So many times what we will do um, is to transfer assets between spouses. And then if we have to do any spend down, it's out of the community spouse's assets. Okay. Um, another thing that we do is we do some gifting and incur the penalty period. It's another thing that we do. Now, the penalty divisor for Medicaid is the same across the state, even though the average cost is different in the four uh, divisions or the four areas. Uh, the way that the state figures this out and the reason it changes uh, at least once a year is they take the average cost in each of the areas of the state, the four divisions, and then they average the averages. And that's how they come up with the penalty divisor. So the penalty divisor is applicable in all counties in Colorado, regardless of where you are. Now, the penalty divisor right now is 7,000, I looked it up a few minutes ago, let me get back to it. Um, oh, it's over here. Mm -hmm. I've got too many things sitting here. Uh, it's 7,545, I believe. 7,563. Okay. Now that will go up because the average cost of nursing homes will go up. And they use that penalty divisor to determine a period, a penalty period. Mm -hmm. Now they figured the penalty period to the day is not, you know, so many months. It is months and days. So you have to be sure that if you want to try and do gifting, that you do it in that way. Now, the reason we might use gifting is, for instance, mom is in assisted living that costs $6,000 a month. The penalty is $7,563 a month. The money that was given away has should be used back for mom, mm -hmm. but then there'll be a little bit left. Okay. And if we can save some assets for the person who is on Medicaid, I want to do that because right now they get to keep $75 a month. Oh, gee, golly, whiz bang. Yeah. You know, like that's going to be enough for a person to, yeah. well, no, it doesn't cover, remember, yeah, Medicaid pays true. for that's prescriptions, true. but it does not pay for clothes, mm -hmm. doesn't pay for trips, doesn't pay for haircuts. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that Medicaid does not pay for that $75 a month won't cover. Right. Now, the other mistake that's out there. I'm going to get into the myths in just a minute, but another mistake out there that you have to watch for with the nursing homes is they think that they get all of the money except for $75. That's not necessarily true because remember if you have a community spouse, if you have a spouse that's staying home, 
they get an allowance if their assets do not cover their needs. And that includes paying for house maintenance, paying for food. Um, I have some clients who the uh, institutionalized spouse is getting about $2,000 a month in Social Security and, and pensions. And the community spouse is getting about $450. Well, of course, that's not going to pay for the house. Right. So there are provisions, and there, again, there are calculations that you can do to show how much money the nursing home will actually get. And in many cases, we have to advocate and educate the nursing home bookkeepers because all they know is $2,000 and we get everything but $75. Right. Okay. So uh, you have to know that there are sources, resources that stay with the community spouse. Do you find that some of these facility, do they take advantage of people in that arena, people that don't know? Are you seeing that at all? Or well, sure? I don't know if I would call it taking advantage. I think it's ignorance. Okay. I think they just don't know. Because I'm sitting here with a notebook with, you know, a couple hundred pages in it of Medicaid regulations, and they just don't have that. They don't have the training. They don't have the background. So in some instances, I would say, yeah, they're just trying to take advantage and get all the money they can, because after all, we are dealing with large corporations. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to make that assumption because I've worked with quite a few facilities and quite a few of them are very good and they do want to know what they're actually supposed to be doing. Right. So, you know, you have to know because you're there to advocate. Uh, I may have to come in later, but I'm usually not the one that's, you know, at the priority at the front line. Right. And your people are. You people mm -hmm. are on the front line. So you need to know something about this as well. Sure. Um, there are resources on the internet that will allow you to do that calculation, that community uh, spouse resource allowance, and there's a utility allowance, there's a housing allowance, there's what we call the MUMNA, the <laughs> monthly minimum maintenance needs allowance, and there's a monthly maximum needs allowance too. So those are, uh, there are a few sites that have those calculations. You really have to look for them. Okay. Um, and then the uh, income cap, uh, I've gotten a lot of questions lately about the income cap. And this is another mistake that people make. They think, well, if I, this year the income cap is $21.99, next year it will be a about 2230. They're expecting uh, Social Security to go up and the income cap is based on the, uh, the payments, the maximum payments that a person can get under Social Security income, you know, SSI. Mm -hmm. So they're expecting that to go up approximately 0.02%. Okay. So that's how I came up with that figure. Uh, I don't have the exact figure, of course. That will come out probably this month. It's been coming out in October of every year. So what do you do when you have a person who is over that income cap? And it can be $1 over. That's when you have to go to an income trust. Yeah. Now, Doing an income trust is not the same thing as doing a special needs trust or some of the more complicated trusts. Medicaid actually has a form that they want you to use. And that is what I call a legal fiction that the federal government has allowed because of the vast difference between the income cap and what people actually need to get the care that they need in a nursing home. The income trust, as I said, it's a form. Anybody can pull it up. The nursing homes like to be the trustee, and they'll give this to you and say, now, see, we have to be the trustee. No, they don't. A family member can be the trustee. However, you have to know the rules. You have to know that the money goes into the trust and then is immediately paid out of the trust okay. in the amount of the patient portion. So that's how we get around... Um, the, the income cap. Okay. 
So yes, there's an income cap, but no, that doesn't prevent you from getting Medicaid. Okay, okay, that's good enough. So um, that's another thing that I've heard a lot lately. Now let's talk about the house. Everybody wants to talk about the house. Number one, the nursing home is not going to take away anyone's house. They don't have anything to do with it. They don't have a lien on it. Nursing homes have, will never touch your house. The house is not a countable asset for the purposes of Medicaid eligibility. Where the house comes in is Medicaid estate recovery. Okay. So the house is not lost until after the person passes away. Now, even if they're not living there, they can keep the house. There's, there's several ways. The easiest way is a uh, intent to return home. Now, the intent to return home under Medicaid is a subjective intent, not objective. And what that means is a person can be on their deathbed, they're never leaving the facility ever again in their lifetime, mm -hmm. and they can still say, I want to go home, and it's not counted as an asset. Okay. Uh, also, if the person is not living there, they can use their personal residence as a rental property. Can't use other residents because then it's an asset. Uh, I recently had people who had two or three rental houses plus the residence, and they had to sell the other homes mm -hmm. so that um, there would not be those assets there. Sure. But if it's your personal residence, you can rent it out. The rent is counted as income, but the house itself is not counted as an asset. Okay. There's two other rules that people need to know about in terms of preserving the home for your family, because this is happening a lot. Um, in, and I have it here, actually, in the regulations. Um, transfer of a home is not a transfer for less than fair market value under a couple of very specific exceptions. Uh, of course, you can transfer it to the spouse. That's not a problem. You can transfer it to a child of the institutionalized person if they're either under the age of 21 or they're disabled. Okay. okay. Now, it has to be a disability as determined by the Social Security Administration. However, I got around that recently. Uh, a person had cerebral palsy but she was still able to work, so Social Security had not de declared her disabled. However, she was declared as handicapped and disabled under her working conditions with the United States government. Okay. So we were able to use that. Uh, the house can also be transferred to a brother or sister who has an equity interest in the home and who was living with the institutionalized person for at least one year. So if you have a brother or sister who's been taking care of mom, they can get the house. Okay. Then the other exception is a son or a daughter of the person who's going into care who has lived with the person for at least two years and has a doctor letter saying that because the son or daughter lived with mom for at least two years, that kept mom out of a nursing home. Okay. And I use mom because it's more often mom than dad, as you know. Right. So I've, I've used these exceptions many times, and they're right here in the book. You know, they're written out, so they can't get around it. Um, they try, I'll admit it. But um, it's, it's black and white. It really is. So those are ways that you can preserve the home even from estate recovery. Okay. But own, ownership of a home does not affect eligibility whatsoever. That's good. Yeah, okay. That's good so that's, that's myth number one that I come in with a lot of times. Um, myth number two. Uh, is you can give away money or assets and Medicaid will never know. <laughs> a 
let me tell you. Um, Medicaid office is connected to the banks. They're con connected to the Division of Labor. They go into these things very, very deeply. Now, they're not going to go into $10 Christmas gifts. That they won't do. But usually anything over $500, they're going to look and see what it's for. That includes Christmas gifts, birthday gifts, graduation gifts. Any gift of money will be included in that. Any gift of the house, as we've already discussed, cars, any large asset is going to be looked at. And the person either has to give back the money or the car or the house or whatever, or the person will incur a penalty period. It's that simple. Okay. Um, so don't assume, people assume, oh, well, they're not going to be able to track this. Oh, you'd be amazed at how easy it is to track this. And what are the penalty periods out of those? Well, the penalty period, as I said, is when you give away money. Mm -hmm. And just because I don't have a calculator in front of me, we're going to say you give away... $75,640, well, they're going to divide that by the 7600 okay, and come up with 10 months of, dis of ineligibility. Okay. So what you do in a case like that is you go ahead and do the application, even though you know it's going to be denied because of this penalty period, but you get the penalty period at the end of it, they're automatically on Medicaid. So you don't have to wait until the end of the penalty period to apply because the penalty period is determined at the start or at the moment you file the application, okay. not you know after a certain period has elapsed. That's another thing that changed in the 2006, I love this, Budget Reconciliation Act. They changed the look-back period because they figured it was going to save the United States government a couple of billion dollars to add a couple, you know, that 24 months onto the penal, uh, the look-back period. Okay. So basically, they balance the budget on the backs of our people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, they're not they're not my clients. They're my people. Right. So uh, that's how the penalty period works, but it works from the date of the application forward. And that's why I said you don't wait until the end of whatever that application period would be. You go ahead and file so that you incur the penalty period immediately. Okay. Okay. And uh, are you going to be able to put this, uh, yeah, this up? I will. One of the slides I have shows how the Medicaid penalty works. So you'll have an example in front of you. Um, myth number three. I'm getting a lot of questions about this. If you have a trust or an annuity, you're fine. Well, no, you're not. Any, um, I, well, a lot of people have heard about the Medicaid trusts. These are irrevocable trusts that people set up. But transfer of assets or money into the irrevocable trust incurs the same penalty as if you gave that money away. The reason being is that you had this money and then under the irrevocable trust, you don't have the money. You've given it away to the trust. So it will incur the same penalty period as if you just gave the money away. So we use the irrevocable trust either in a gifting scenario like we discussed earlier or in what I call the five-year plan. Um, I don't know how many of you out there know the, what the five-year plans used to be, but in the Soviet Union they always said they had a five-year plan <laughs> for improvement. So I, I always hate using that term, but that's what it is. And uh, you can use a trust in that way to protect assets from Medicaid. Okay. Now, there are annuities out there that are Medicaid compliant, but there are specific rules for Medicaid annuities. And the only company I know of right now that's doing them is Nationwide. Okay. 
Now these annuities, you have to have an insurance person that knows what these are. If you say to a person trying to sell you an annuity, is this Medicaid compliant? And he says, oh, I don't know. That's not the annuity you need because the Medicaid compliant annuities have to be immediately available. In other words, there's no vesting period for a Medicaid annuity. It can be left, the um, remainder, if there is any, can be left to the spouse, but Medicaid has to be in the second position. Okay. Also, it has to be actuarially sound, and the actuary tables that they use are their own. It's in their regulations. Okay. So it's not the same mortality table that they have in the Colorado statutes or anything like that. It's in the regulations. So what has to happen is if you're going to put $100,000 in a Medicaid-compliant annuity, that's great because it takes it out of the assets. Okay. However, the money that's paid from the annuity is income. Okay, and the income does not go to the person. It goes to the nursing home or it goes to the income trust. Okay. The advantage of having the annuity is that it reduces the amount of a possible lien that Medicaid may have, the estate recovery that Medicaid may have. Okay. Um, and it helps somebody be immediately uh, available. Um, a scenario where I've had that happen very recently was today actually. There's a gentleman who has a traumatic brain injury and is tube fed and is non-communicative and he's been on Medicaid for 16 years. Well his brother just passed away and guess what? He left his brother $60,000. Well of course if he gets that $60,000 he's over asset and he is, I mean for him it's a life or death situation. Okay we can use that annuity to make sure that his benefits are protected. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah. you know, mostly we use it in situations like that. Do you find that happens a lot where a family member dies and then they leave somebody a substantial amount of money? Yeah, yes. That happens a lot, I bet. Yeah. That happens a lot because they think they're helping the family member. You know, well, I want to make sure they're taken care of. Well, what should have happened is a family member can set up a special needs trust for a person under 65. Okay. And, excuse me, and then the money goes to that, to the trust, to that special needs trust. Okay. And that's okay because it's set up by a third person. It's when the money is given to the patient and then the, the patient basically has to set up the trust themselves. It's called a first person trust. That's where you get the transfer. Okay. If it's a third person trust, there's no transfer penalty. Okay. And then you have a trustee or an executive that's managing that for the individual yes. and getting it, getting things paid for and all yes. that. Yes. Um, okay. I tend to use the uh, Center for People with uh, Colorado Fund for People with Disabilities, CFPD. Okay. They're very good. They do cost but they're very good, they know what they're doing, and they're also at the head of the litigation, the current litigation, about setting up a special needs trust for people over the age of 65. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, do we have any questions? I don't know. Let me... Uh, I want to give people the chance to ans ask questions. Absolutely. We can open this up. The, uh, so, I'm, uh, you, can, you can either... Move the mic over here. You yeah. can either um, uh, give me a chat. There's a chat button on your screen there. You can go ahead and um, uh, send that across, and I can ask Rose those questions. Um, I try to keep everybody muted just because there's a little bit of background noise that ha occurs on that. We do have one question, Rose. Uh, can they decline the inheritance? No. Okay. Under the Medicaid regulations, no, they cannot decline the inheritance. Again, that's what they're trying to do is make sure that everybody uses their own money first. So they cannot decline the inheritance. Uh, it will be considered as a gift or a transfer for less than fair market value. Okay. Do you find uh, another question that popped in here? Is there an average dollar amount for spouse allowance? 
No, it's a, a, it's the exact calculation that I talked about, the okay. community spouse resource allowance. What they do, and the reason, one of the reasons that the Medicaid application is so long, it's still 28 pages, um, is that they want to know the living expenses, how much the mortgage is, uh, how much equity is in the home, because that's under the regulations. The home is not considered an asset up to 500, this year it's 530 some odd dollars in equity. Okay. So that's why they want to know the equity. And the figures that are used in the, you know, how much total assets, not income, because the income of the spouse does not count. Okay. But they do ask it, because then that does count for the purposes of the community spouse resource allowance. If, the, for instance, the community spouse's income is $400 and they need $2,000 in income to maintain the home, yeah. that's, that's where they use those figures. The minimum resource allowance this year is about $1,950 a month. Housing allowance is about $550. I can look up the exact figures, but they're on the Internet, too. Um, maximum resource allowance is about 2300 I think. Okay. Okay. So there's no average because it does, it is based on those uh, calculations. Okay. Uh, another question that's come in, so based on your experience and uh, what you are seeing, what are the two things you'd recommend to a younger baby boomer to be doing now in order to be prepared later? Okay. Uh, younger baby boomer. I have a few of those. I'm not one, but that's okay. Um, number one, I would look into long-term care insurance. And the long-term care insurance they should be looking at is on what's called the partnership program. A partnership program, uh, a, an insurance agent has to be licensed to sell partnership program insurance. What it does is it protects additional assets from Medicaid. For instance, uh, my personal long-term care insurance this year has a cash value of, I think it's $250,000. Well, that's an additional $250,000 I can shield oh, really? from okay. Medicaid okay. because the insurance is going to pay for it, not Medicaid. Um, so a long-term care insurance is big. That everybody needs if you can afford it. Um, then the other thing for anybody who's going on Medicaid, make sure their funeral plan is paid for because funeral expenses in, that are put into an irrevocable trust for the funeral and the funeral homes all have this. Mm -hmm. There's like three or four different companies that handle those arrangements. Those are not considered an asset for the purposes of Medicaid. So having somebody spend their money down on a funeral, prepaid funeral plans, is really a good idea. Really? Okay. Yeah, it is, whether you want to be cremated or whatever. Okay. It's a good idea. Uh, another thing I would do is if somebody is in good health, is go ahead and set up that irrevocable trust. Even though it's a first-party trust, remember that after 60 months, it, that money is set aside and those assets are set aside from Medicaid. Okay. Um, I don't know what else offhand I would do right now. What's your read? I know there's been some new, you know, historically over the last 20 years, you know, the, the, the long-term care policy was kind of the only thing out here. But now you're starting to see there's like life insurance programs that they put a long-term care rider on there. Right. The cost doesn't seem to be that much different, but there seems to be a, uh, you know, to your point you just made, there's a cash value assigned to it that you can utilize if you need to or whatever. Um, what's your read on those? Well, life insurance is considered an asset if the cash value of the policy is over 1500 Okay. So that's why, I mean... In general, if you don't think you're ever going to need Medicaid, like you've got a couple of million dollars stashed away, mm -hmm. and some of my clients do, mm -hmm. um, it's a good idea. But, uh, you know, if you have somebody that has been using life insurance as a savings account 
or a savings device of some kind. And the cash value, not the face value, but the cash value is over 1500 It's an asset. You have to cash it in. Okay. Okay. So the product itself I like, but for the purposes of Medicaid, it can be a problem. Okay. Um, okay. Another question that came up. Uh, why are the assets so extremely different, that comparison that you mentioned, between a single person and a couple, 2000 versus 121? Well, when I talk about the 121, that's the spouse that's remaining at home. And what the government did was uh, try to make sure that they were not impoverishing the spouse so that the spouse would need additional benefits that the government would also have to pay for. So that's why they did that. The single person going into care and getting care from Medicaid doesn't need as much as a person who's remaining in the community, okay. at least in their philosophy. And one other question here, uh, can Medicaid cap out? No. Okay, no cap. No cap. All right. That's all we got for right now. So, okay, yeah. well, I'll go back to yeah. mistakes that people make. Okay. Um, a big one is depending on the internet for advice or depending on the neighbor down the street or depending even on your own experience for advice. Um, I get this all the time and I'm sure you do too, uh, that people say, well, my uncle in Nebraska had Medicaid and this is the way it worked. Well, remember that each state has different Medicaid rules. For instance, in Colorado, the person can keep $75. In South Carolina, they can only keep $30. Oh, wow. Okay. So there, is a, there are a lot of differences. Uh, in some states, the children can be liable to pay for the parents' care. Not in Colorado. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, I, I said go on the internet for these calculators. Uh, there are some good ones, but the other advice about whether you can do certain things, only rely on people within your own state. And I hate to say it, but don't rely on the advice of social workers. They are very good people. I work with many of them in care management, in support for my people. Mm -hmm. But I get updates every day on Medicaid. They don't. That's not their area. Right. Just like social work is not mine, although you wouldn't know it sometimes <laughs> with the people who come into my office. Um, so if you have a question, have a resource that you can rely on to give you the right answer. Okay. I mean, like, you can call me. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> and I get calls from, I, I get calls from Adult Protective Services. I get calls from other attorneys. I get calls all the time from people regarding Medicaid rules and regulations because this does sit on my desk. Yeah, absolutely. Totally understand. Um, another thing that people ask is can they be paid for taking care of their loved one? The answer to that is yes, but they have to have a personal care contract. It's like an employment contract. Mm -hmm. And it has to be reasonable. Uh, it has to be something that's in writing. What you're supposed to do, like you would with any other at link, uh, arm's length or third party. Mm -hmm. Um, it can't be saying, okay, I'm going to pay you $100 an hour because that's that's going to be turned away by Medicaid because um, that's unreasonable. Right. So it can't be used as or seen to be used as a transfer of assets to a family member. Okay. The easier way to do it, uh, there is a company that will certify someone as a certified nurse assistant, the CNA, mm -hmm. and they can be paid. And we have a couple of families that do that for children who have developmental delays or autism. Right. And, you know, and we do that uh, as people care. That's one of our responsibilities through the mm -hmm. waiver program. You know, HCBS and IHSS, particularly, you see it a lot with IHSS clients. They'll, the in-home support 
similar to CDOS, where they actually work for us. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, so I, that probably fulfills that requirement that you're it talking does. about because they're an employee of ours. And, yes, and it we does. bill Medicaid, and then they, they get an hourly wage that they use for certain tasks in the home. Um, some people di uh, just want to handle, you know, the laundry and, you know, non-medical tasks. Mm -hmm. And I do, I have prepared personal services contracts for that. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, what we're seeing more and more of because of the Iraq and the Afghan war is veterans who need 24-7 care. Okay. As a result, the Veterans Administration has instituted a program where a family member can be trained as a caregiver and get paid. Okay. And the VA will pay for their training, it'll pay for transportation, it'll pay for all of that because the VA hospitals are so overrun. Now, is that mainly non-medical related stuff or are you seeing skilled components dropping? No, of... that's for non-medical related. Okay. okay. And they will pay for three people a day each, you know, three eight-hour shifts. Okay. And that's mostly for, and that's only for people in the Afghan and Iraq wars. It's not for the older veterans. Okay. Now there's a new veterans program for people who may be may have been exposed to Agent Orange. Right. And but that that also has very specific um, requirements. You know where they served, how they served. Yeah, and I know the military looks into those pretty pretty closely because there are some areas where they didn't think they had Agent Orange, and then they find out, oh yeah, well they did some spraying there. They had it. We thought they had it contained there, and then it was bombed, and then, you know, it sprayed everywhere, so, yeah. Well, one of the things they've done is they've said that you had to be in Vietnam or in certain bases in, in um, the United States that either manufactured the product or the crews that worked on certain planes that sprayed the product. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's how they're handling that. Interesting. Okay. So, what else do we have? Uh, another question. Do you have any opinions of, of what the shift will be depending on which party wins the election? And I guess this could be federal and state level. It um, would be. Okay. Uh, because remember that half of the regulations for Medicaid are by state, half are federal. Right. So, the federal regulations, I'm very concerned. Mm -hmm. Um. And I don't want to say I, I'm voting for one person or another. Sure. Uh, because that's not what this is about. <laughs> but but um, I'm more concerned about the House races because it's in the House of Representatives where these bills come out regarding funding. Mm -hmm. And so I am concerned that if there are more Republicans than we now have in the House, uh, that that could change the dynamic of Medicaid and Medicare mm -hmm. uh, because Paul Ryan is the Speaker of the House and his plan that he put forward many years ago includes cutting benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think we can afford to cut benefits on anybody. Right. So, uh, like I said, uh, the presidential race, Good, bad, or indifferent, I think, is sewn up at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm more worried about the House. Yeah. Okay, because that's that's where these funding items come What's from. What's your thoughts here at the state level? What are you seeing at the state level that you think it's going to be pretty much status quo? I, mean, I it think it's going to be pretty much status quo at the state level. Okay. Um, the Colorado Bar Association Elder Law Section, and I'm on the executive board, has been working very closely with the uh, Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, HICPUF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we work very closely with HICPUF regarding their regulations, and there is also ongoing litigation that's been funded by the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys regarding our cutoff for special needs cases at 65. Okay. okay. So that's going through the courts right now. Okay. Let's see if we got anything else here. Um, somebody asked what your last name was again. 
I always have to spell it. It's Zapor. It's Ukrainian. It's Z like zebra, A, P like Paul, O, R. And it so happens, by the way, that in Colorado, we're very fortunate because we have a past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and the current president of the National Academy here in Colorado. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Bradley Fregon uh, was president of the National Academy two years ago, and um, Catherine Seal is the current president, and she's in Colorado Springs. That's great. So we have some great resources here in Colorado. This is an interesting question. It goes back to a comment that you made about uh, certain states requiring kids to be responsible. If the parents live in Florida, kids live in Colorado, can the kids still be responsible for the parents' care? Yes, because that's a state regulation. Okay. That's done by state. Okay. So they could... Technically I don't you. know offhand if Florida, Florida is one of those states. The, the only one that comes to mind, I know there are more, but the only one that comes to mind is Michigan. Okay. Uh, here's another interesting question. Uh, will the VA cover a person who has been exposed to the burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, it's not any person. Remember, VA at this point only covers persons who were in the regular army, not National Guard. Okay. So it's just regular army. Is it any branch of the military? Yes, it's okay. any branch of the military. When other I than say National regular, Guard. Okay. Other than National Guard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I had a Social Security case with a man who had been in Iraq as a translator. He was a civilian translator. The poor guy had been blown up three times and he couldn't get uh, help from the VA. Wow, so, that's just that's frustrating for everybody. I think because those a lot of those guys earn their they earn their stripes doing what they're doing, so right. they should get whatever care is required to take care of them. We were finally able to get Social Security for him, but yeah, yeah. Um, what are the best resources for learning more about this topic? Is it you know get you know kind of putting together a notebook of the regulations like you've got there? Yeah. Yeah, um, I had a wonderful professor in law school who, who every time somebody would say, well, what's this or what's that, he, he had a saying that said RTS, and uh, that means read the statute. Okay. That's, I mean, I learned it by reading the statutes, and uh, of course, as an attorney, I went to some continuing legal education on the matter. By the way, um, I can say that there's the Colorado Guardianship Alliance. It's very good and open to anybody. There is actually, you can attend continuing legal education. Anybody can attend. I've sent my paralegal to uh, a lot of continuing legal education classes on guardianships and conservatorships, uh, basic elder law, advanced elder law, and many of these uh, classes are online. Okay. So you can you can access them. Uh, you can also be an associate member of the Colorado Bar Association so that you get notices of these uh, of these classes. Okay. And uh, you know you don't have to be an attorney to, con to uh, attend continuing legal education. And okay. I highly recommend it. Like I said, I've sent my paralegal to those classes, and she knows as much or more about Medicaid than practically any attorney in town because she deals with the forms. I mean, that's not a legal decision. That's filling out forms. So I have her doing that. And she also does a lot of the calls with um, the various county uh, health and human services because it saves our people money and yeah, gives them a, 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 a contact who's there all the time since I'm in court a lot. Sure. No, that makes sense. Um, this kind of rolls back to the previous question about being in a state where the kids are responsible. Um, how, is there a way for the kids to protect themselves from that happening, number one? 
and, or can they? Is there anything you can... I don't really know do? because I'm not licensed in those states and we do not have that provision in Colorado. Okay. So I would recommend if you have that question to contact an elder law attorney in that state. Okay. Okay. Do they list... I suppose it's in every state regulation as far as who's responsible for what. Yeah. Right. Okay. Another thing I, I can bring up uh, to protect yourself is uh, never ever sign as a responsible person for somebody going into a nursing home. Okay. Because that does make you personally liable. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the contracts I'm seeing now in nursing homes and assisted living, wow. Um, you actually have to read every page because they have in their definitions section, they have responsible person is the family member who is responsible for the person in care. And then you go on down and it says the responsible person is also accepting financial responsibility. Mm, okay. So I've been warning my clients, don't sign binding arbitration agreements. You don't have to. It's not required. And be careful about signing as a responsible person. Now, does that include POAs? If you are a POA, you have to sign the person's name as POA for the person. Okay. Okay. And then that protects you from personal liability. A POA is not personally liable for finances. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um... Well, if uh, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, please, uh, if you'd like to, go ahead and you can pass them through on the chat bar there, and we can answer any uh, any others that come through. Um, I've still got time, <laughs> so I can tell you while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions. Uh, I was the caregiver for my own mother okay. until she passed away at the age of 97. So I had to read these contracts for her as well as for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, she and I had talked a lot about what would happen in case because my aunt, her sister, had Alzheimer's back in the 80s before we knew a whole lot about Alzheimer's. Believe it or not, it's only been in the last 30 years that we've learned as much as we've learned. And there were no such things as memory care. You went into a skilled nursing facility. Yeah. And one day we went into my aunt's room because we, there was somebody with her every day to make sure she was getting taken care of. And they were feeding her through a tube. She was non-communicative by that time. And we walked in. There was actually a handprint on her face where somebody had slapped her because she was trying to pull the tube out of her nose. So I'm very aware of all kinds of issues like this. Mm -hmm. And what you do is so important, especially when people are in nursing homes, because there's study after study after study that says if a person has somebody there, at least on a weekly basis, if not more often, mm -hmm. the patient gets better care. Okay. Yeah. That because they know somebody's looking over their shoulder. Mm-hmm. And the, I've only had to pull out the lawyer card twice, you know, pulling up the, I'm a lawyer and you, excuse my language, but you damn well better do what I say or else. <laughs> Once was with my husband, who also has a disability mm -hmm. now, and once was with my mother. Yeah. Because uh, I told them, do not give her narcotics she reacts very badly to narcotics. And I got a call at 10 o'clock at night asking how long she'd had Alzheimer's. She didn't have Alzheimer's. Oh, okay. So, you know, and then when I talked to the doctor, he said, oh, well, we forgot that uh, medicine works differently on older people. Wow. You're in a nursing home. No, this was in the hospital. Well, this is in the hospital. Okay. Which is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, Yeah. Um, the work that you do just by being there from time to time is important. Yeah. That seems to be one of the bigger challenges for the Medicaid population is, um, you know, whether it's just the standard care or, you know, memory or Alzheimer's care for this population. There doesn't seem to be 
institutions or or housing locations for a lot of these people to go. I mean, the That's beds right. the beds seem to be very small as far as what's out there. Are you are you seeing that? Do you perceive that's going to improve, or do you see it staying the same? Yeah, I see it staying the same because there are seven corporations that control over 90% of the beds. And, of course, they don't want a Medicaid bed because that doesn't pay them as much. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the private residential care homes now are requiring three years of private pay before they'll accept a Medicaid bed. Wow, okay. It was one year when I started this, and then it inched up, and now there are some that require three years before they'll accept Medicaid. Hmm. Interesting. So, no, I don't see that going up. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, looks like we can probably wrap up. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for, for giving us your insight and... Uh, and understanding. I do have uh, Rose's um, PowerPoint presentation. I'll be uploading that uh, with this presentation and we uh, certainly appreciate her coming in and, and providing her insight. I met Rose at the uh, both the estate planning and the elder law uh, conferences that we had here in the state of Colorado and as she stated I would encourage anybody that has an opportunity to possibly go to one of those conferences. They're very, very educational Lots of good information, and you'll meet uh, several people, uh, maybe not with necessarily with the experience that Rose has, but certainly people that are knowledgeable in the area of, uh, of Medicaid and how to care for this uh, population. So anyway, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. We appreciate your, your time and taking uh, the last 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and we look forward to uh, hearing or seeing you again. Our next uh, presentation will be in November, second Wednesday of the month at uh, 1 p.m. That's the 9th at 1 p.m. And we'll be talking to uh, an, a, a estate auctioning group that uh, works with uh, people all over the state to try to liquidate their um, assets from their home, particularly those hard assets like furnishings and stuff like that. Thanks again. We look forward to uh, uh, seeing you again next time on uh, with People Care Educational Services. Thanks. <laughs>